Good afternoon. My name is Kenya McDuffie, Council Member for Ward 5 and Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Today is Monday, February 25th, 2013. We are in room 120 of the John A. Wilson Building and the time is 2.05 p.m. I'm calling to order this public roundtable on proposed resolution 20-0013. The Office of Employee Appeals, Nicola Shaw Confirmation Resolution of 2013, and Proposed Resolution 20-0014, the Office of Employee Appeals, Alvin Gilbert Douglas Jr. Confirmation Resolution of 2013. PR 20-0013 and PR 20-0014 were initially introduced on November 15, 2012 in Council Period 19 with PR numbers of 19-1112 and 19-1113 respectively. Both were introduced by, Council, uh, by Chairman Mendelson at the request of the Mayor and once we changed over in the Council Period 20, they were assigned uh, their new PR numbers. The Office of Employee Appeals is an independent agency of the District of Columbia which was created by the Comprehensive Merit Personnel Act. The office is tasked with adjudicating employee appeals and rendering impartial decisions. The office's jurisdiction encompasses appeals of final agency decisions such as a performance rating which results in removal of the employee, an adverse action for cause which results in removal, a reduction in grade, a suspension for 10 days or more, a reduction in force, or a placement on enforced leave for 10 days or more. As far as our district employees' rights go, this agency is extremely important. However, as recently as October of 2012, the board had no members. Uh, in, in November of 2012, three members were appointed to the board, and Ms. Shaw and Mr. Douglas's nominations, if confirmed, would finally give the office a full complement of members. It is extremely important that the office have its full complement of members. As we learned in our performance oversight hearing just a couple of weeks ago, the office is still suffering from a backlog of cases, though Ms. Barfield and her team are diligently working through that backlog. Uh, having all five members of the office will give the office more flexibility in scheduling more meetings and resolving more cases without the added concern of struggling to find a quorum. The Office of Employee Appeals enabling legislation requires that its members shall have demonstrated knowledge concerning personnel management or labor relations and a reputation for impartiality and integrity in the discharge of their responsibilities. Today I look forward to hearing from both of our nominees on how their years of experience qualify them as members of this important office. We have three public witnesses today. I'll give everyone three minutes uh, for their testimony, and then we'll hear from our nominees. And with that, I'd like to call up our first panel of public witnesses to testify. Uh, we have Ms. Allegra McCullough, Mr. Carl Brown, Jr., as well as Laura Richards. If you all could come forward, please. We, we had a panel uh, of three. I noticed that uh, Mr. Brown is not present. I don't know if there are any other witnesses who would like to uh, testify uh, on this panel. Any other public witnesses? For sure. Well, uh, we will begin uh, from my left and your right uh, with Ms. Richards. Good afternoon, Chairman Duffy. Uh, I'm Laura Richards, a Ward 7 resident and retired federal lawyer appearing in support of A. Gilbert Douglas's nomination to the Office of Employee Appeals. Uh, my family has known Mr. Douglas for 30 years. He is and is known to be a person of deep personal integrity. He is highly respected and valued by his fellow members of the bar, the congregation of his church, the numerous service and for fraternal organizations of which he is a member and his many friends. Throughout his adult life and the decades of his legal career, Mr. Douglas regularly has been asked to assume positions of trust. He served for many years on the board of the Washington Bar Association, playing an active role in the association's educational and service projects. He also has held leadership positions in his church, Plymouth Congregational. 
Among other things, he was instrumental in establishing an investment club to promote financial literacy and wealth accumulation. He is an active member of his fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, acting as a friend and mentor to younger members. Mr. Douglas has the probity and impartiality required to adjudicate fairly appeals from district government employees. He works collegially with others while maintaining his independence in reaching decisions. As a practicing attorney for more than 30 years, he is able to draw on a wealth of experience in business and legal transactions and legal rela human relations. Mr. Douglas is unfailingly discreet and trustworthy with money and confidential information. As a measure of my family's respect for the nominee, I note that Mr. Douglas and his wife are godparents to our son, Sam. My husband's here today. In that role, no one could have been more solicitous and attentive to Sam's welfare. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, mm -hmm. Ms. Richards. Uh, Ms. McCullough? citizen and concerned resident of the district. I'm here to support the confirmation and the appointment of Ms. Nicola Shaw to the Office of Employee Appeals. I am proud to support the nomination of Nicola Shaw to the Office of Employee Appeals and feel honored that she requested my support. I rarely give personal references because in giving a personal reference, one places one's judgment and integrity at risk should the reference party not perform adequately. In Ms. Shaw's case, however, I do not have any doubts that she will carry out the duties required of this position. I first met Ms. Shaw in 2003 when she was the Executive Director of the U.S. Department of Commerce's Minority Business Development Agency's grantee location leading the National Capital Minority Op Opportunity Commission and a member of the Advisory Board of the U.S. Small Business Administration's District of Columbia Office. At that time, I was the Region 3 Administrator for the SBA, and I became impressed very quickly with Ms. Shaw's leadership and negotiating skills and providing guidance and support to that SBA office. When Ms. Shaw was appointed as a Senior Consultant to the Governor's Office of Minority Affairs for the State of Maryland <coughs> excuse me, in 2004, and I became the Associate Deputy Administrator of Government Contracting and Business Development at the SBA, Ms. Shaw became a mentor to me, willingly sharing her vast knowledge of government contracting and equal employment laws. I found Ms. Shaw's research ability, her attention to detail, and her knowledge of state and federal contracting and EEO laws invaluable to me in making decisions based on historical context. Ms. Shaw's confirmation as a member <coughs> of the Committee on Employee Appeals will bring additional strength to the district in the area of EEO, contracting, mediation, and integrity. Ms. Law, Ms. Shaw continues to be a colleague, a mentor, and a friend, and I'm proud to support her in this endeavor. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared remarks, and I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for your testimony. I want to thank uh, both witnesses uh, for their testimony. Uh, I don't have uh, many questions for you all, but I will note um, that it, it speaks volumes, uh, I think, to the nominees to have uh, uh, such impressive witnesses testify on their behalf. So I, I know a little bit about you both uh, and, and what you all bring to the table in terms of your professional background and experience. And so uh, the, the fact that you all are here today testifying on behalf of these nominees uh, is very important to me as chair of the committee. Uh, I also want to say in your testimony, uh, Ms. Richards, you mentioned that Mr. Douglas and his wife are the godparents of your son. And, and I don't know if there's anything that really uh, puts as much trust and, and, and faith in a person than to allow that person to be a godparent to one's child. Uh, being a parent myself, I know how much that actually means. And so that uh, definitely will take that into consideration. And Ms. McCullough, I think you said something very important in your testimony when you said that one, uh, and, and given these sorts of uh, personal references and, and testifying on behalf of nominees actually places uh, uh, your uh, judgment and integrity at risk. And I think, you know, that, that, that's not lost on me that, that you would come forward and speak so highly of uh, Ms. Shaw and her capabilities uh, and her professional capacity because I think uh, with this board, this very important uh, board, uh, we definitely need uh, candidates 
uh, who have the, the, the knowledge and experience to, to really uh, join the, the, the office and, and hit the ground running. Um, uh, the learning curve is, is fairly short in this capacity, particularly given uh, the number of cases, uh, the important matters that this, this, this uh, Office of Employee Appeals actually deals with. And so uh, I really appreciate both of you all being here. I will ask uh, each of you, though, uh, you spoke very highly of the candidates, but if there was uh, you know, one particular asset uh, that you each think uh, Ms. Shaw and, and, and uh, Mr. Um, Douglas brings to the table for this office, what is that particular asset that you think is going is to really make the difference uh, in, in, in helping the work and the job uh, at the Office of Employee Appeals? I would pick two. Um, one would be, I guess, uh, persistence in searching the records. Um, when Mr. Douglas has an issue before him, you know, he will really weigh it and um, he will look at all sides and he enjoys the, the give and take of the analytic process. So uh, he's not going to flip through any case records and give them short shrift or reach any predetermined conclusions. And I think the second one would have to be generosity. I think there's kind of a large generosity there. So that um, I think that's very important so that justice be tempered with some sort of equity. That definitely is very important. Ms. Shaw brings so many assets to the table, <laughs> um, but if I had to isolate two, um, they would be her knowledge of EEO laws and um, her level of integrity. Okay. All right. Uh, all very important qualities uh, to this very important uh, uh, office. Uh, I don't have any additional questions. I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your, your busy schedules to, to come down and testify on behalf of these nominees. Uh, it, it's very important for this committee. Uh, and its consideration of the nominees to, to have uh, this sort of testimony to, to bolster uh, what we see on paper uh, on, on the uh, other candidates and also uh, to support uh, uh, the questions that I'll be asking these candidates when they come up to testify. So thank you very much. Thank you. And if the nominees would please come forward, uh, Ms. Nicola Shaw and Mr. Alvin Gilbert Douglas, Jr. And this time around, I'll begin to my right. Uh, to your left, if you want to uh, provide a statement to the committee. Ms. Shaw, you'd like to begin? Good afternoon, Chairman McDuffie and members of the Committee on Government Operations. I am Nicola Yvonne Shaw, and I am honored to be nominated by the Honorable Mayor Vincent C. Gray to become a member of the Board of Office of Employee Appeals and to have the pleasure to appear before each of you today. I have resided in the District of Columbia for more than 40 years, and currently I'm a homeowner in Ward 5. Even though I have lived in Wards 4 and 8 during my earlier years, I have had the privilege of being reared by my parents, John and Sarah Shaw, who ensured that I was educated in the D.C. public school system, I have been employed in the district and partake in the many opportunities that the nation's capital offers. I'm here today to testify and provide an overview of my career experiences with which support not only my interests in serving as a vital board member for the Office of Employee Appeals but will also outline some of my qualifications for confirmation. Let me start by highlighting that I have over 25 years of experience in management, contract administration, small minority and disadvantaged business implementation, as well as a thorough knowledge and experience in the personnel, labor relations, and the mediation process. Throughout my career, I have been involved in the implementation and practice of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which now includes the Lilly Ledbetter 
Fair Pay Action of 2009. These regulatory and statutory laws provide for the recovery of com compensation and punitive, punitive damages in cases of intentional violations of labor laws. I have obtained executive leadership and development training in labor contract negotiations, federal equal employment opportunity and affirmative action, EEO, AA complaints, violence in the workforce, investigation complaints of EEO, AA, Americans with Disabilities Act, law, implementation policy, and dispute resolution, and come prepared as well as being ready, willing, and able with the appropriate tools to form and render an educated, impartial, legally sufficient, and timely decision on petitions of appeals, as well as by any of the 40,000 member workforce of the District of Columbia government. Many of the accreditations and certifications that I have received come from extensive training by the U.S. Equal Opportunity Commit Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and most recently, the American Contract Compliance Association, ACCA, which is the only nationally recognized organization that offers classes to practitioners who focus on fair and equitable justice to businesses and people for proper implementation of the laws and regulations and equitable justice to the business arena and employment practices. This executive session of the ACCA is held in cooperation with Morgan State University, which of course, each of you are aware, is a historically black college in Baltimore, Maryland, and the largest HBCU in the state of Maryland. These classes focus on comprehension and clarification of the EEO, AA laws and statutes, as well as contract negotiations and labor relations. Because of this intensive training from ACCA, I have received my Master Compliance Administrator's Accreditation. From a professional standpoint, I have held numerous leadership positions at the federal, state, and local levels in which I have supervised personnel from 7 to 135 in the professional and administrative support arenas, adhering to the appropriate federal, state, and local employment regulations and requirements. In addition to being an independent contractor, entrepreneur, I have focused on matters relating to labor negotiations, contract compliance, and EEO, AA, in the pursuit of fair and equitable employment practices. A more detailed copy of my career was outlined in my resume and attached to the proposed resolution on November 15, 2012. As a litigation consultant, subject matter expert, confirmed by the state of California for over 10 years. I worked with the law firm as a member of their team to bring resolution to a construction contractor who violated labor and personnel laws, federal contracting terms and conditions, and practice unlawful payment to employees, contractors, and subcontractors. During this contract period, I was required to view thousands, to review thousands of EEO, AA, and ADA documents by the contractor who had committed fraud in their contracting practices and unfair practices in employment. The results of this case established that the contractor was not adhering to the federal terms and conditions, practiced blatant fraud, and overcharged the entity by millions of dollars. Due to this flagrant misrepresentation, the court charged the contractor guilty of the crime and debarred him from future contracting opportunities with the agency and required a $45 million penalty of repayment. Through this process, I was able to utilize my knowledge of labor 
and personnel laws. However, most recently, I represented a family member at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission concerning a case of age discrimination. I prepared the formal complaint, represented my family member at the mediation table, and made recommendations for resolution. The outcome of this pro bono case was reflected in demands that were best for my family member and the organization. Therefore, showing how both sides can win. This was a clear case of effective utilization of my negotiation skills and knowledge of civil rights laws. Currently, I am employed by the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Metro, and responsible for its small business and local preference program. This responsibility requires the knowledge and skill set of understanding fair practices in a competitive environment, contract compliance, and negotiations. While at the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, Amtrak, with more than 26,000 employees in 1989 as the acting director, my responsibilities included negotiating contracts for minority and women-owned businesses and ensuring that firms received a fair and equitable opportunity to compete while effectively utilizing internal and external requirements for labor and contract negotiations. I also served as the Director, Special Programs, Minority and Women-Owned Business Division during President Clinton's administration at the Resolution Trust Corporation and Manager, Special Programs Office of Diversity and Economic Development at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, in which I had the responsibility <coughs> of supervising more than 10 employees providing them with guidance, developing performance evaluations, training, mentoring, and an opportunity for promotion. Because of my commitment and due to my advocacy for persons and businesses by ensuring that I help to create a level playing field for all, I have received numerous local and national awards. However, in 2011, I was nominated by the Minority Business Magazine as one of 50 most powerful women of minority business. I also gained experience working with union representatives and negotiating fair practices for the members of the Brotherhood of Railroad and Steam Ship Clerks, Handlers, Express and Station Employees, otherwise known as BRAC while employed at Amtrak. This involvement allowed me an opportunity to ensure that fair hiring practices for the administrative and support personnel, which included people of color and women particularly. I was a part of the mediation process, which aided employees in resolving employee complaints without having to compete, complete the entire appeal process. During my first career move to Metro, in addition to managing certification, contract compliance, and methods of fraud on contracts, my responsibilities included investigating EEO complaints, acting as a mediator, and I was a member of the dispute resolution team. As a grantee with the U.S. Department of Commerce, Minority Business Development Agency, I led the National Capital Minority Business Opportunity Commission as its executive director, charged with the responsibility of providing access to market, capital, and assistance to the region's minority businesses. My attention to details, knowledge of the federal regulations for contracting and EEO laws, and affirmative action laws proved to be invaluable and making fair decisions about contracting opportunities and employees. I have served the City of the District of Columbia for four years as an elected official of Ward 5 in the capacity of Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner in 5A05, now 5B05, 
and also held the position of treasurer in the third year of my tenure, ensuring that we followed the established regulatory requirements for our allotted budget and making sure that the reporting of the utilization of the city's funds were properly disseminated and submitted on time to the DC auditor's office and in accordance with the regulations. I work diligently to ensure that the citizens of my, my community were safe, provided with current information, and educated them on topics that would impact my single member district. I leave that service knowing that I have expanded their health care service options by working with Providence Hospital personnel, not only for assisting my single member district, but for other residents of the District of Columbia by advocating and supporting the new construction project expansions for state-of-the-art emergency room and imaging center. These new facilities, which will serve the community by ensuring that the health needs of our citizens are met. This was done through the inclusion of appropriate contracting language to provide equal opportunity and affirmative action mechanisms for potential contracting opportunities and were clearly indicated our commitment as a city for our small, local, and disadvantaged businesses. I continue to be proud to have served in several different capacities throughout my career and hopefully have empowered a few to continue their career pursuits. I am hopeful and humbled to be nominated as one of the board members for the Office of Appeals and hope that this information will assist in formulating a confirmation for one of the current vacancies. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared remarks. I thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you, Ms. Shaw, for your testimony. Mr. Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. the Honorable Kenyon McDuffie. Mr. Uh, Douglas, if you can make sure the green light is on in front of you. Uh, yes, it is. I'm sorry, the green light on your microphone, I should say. Oh. And, and the mic is not going to move, and so you probably just have to speak up a little bit to project oh. your voice. Is this better? That's much oh, better. I, Thank you. I have to put you. All right. Thank you. To the, to the honor, Honorable Kenyon McDuffie, Subcommittee Chairman of the D.C. Council's Government Operations Subcommittee. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Alvin Gilbert Douglas, Jr. It is my pleasure and duty to appear before you and other council members of the Council Subcommittee, uh, if they may be watching. I hope that my qualifications, experience, and answers to your roundtable questions will allow your recommendation my appointment to the full council as a board member of the Office of Employee Appeals. I make this request because I've been nominated by Mayor Vincent C. Gray and because my prior experience consists of many relevant aspects of service during my 39 years as an attorney at law in Pennsylvania and in the District of Columbia. Uh, most of which is provided for in more detail in my resume, which I believe that you have a copy of. Uh, for the most part, my accomplishments are set forth in my resume as stated, and in the several weeks since my uh, nomination, I've undertaken to make myself familiar with the statutory authority, the procedures, and the recent history of the Office of Employee Appeals here and after the OEA. I uh, hope that my experience makes me well qualified to serve. I've had long experience in several capacities. I'll just mention them briefly. As a decision writer and arbitrator in many lawsuits, I've obtained the evaluations of evidence, both written and spoken. And by the way, I want to mention that uh, I was initially appointed in my 20s as an investigator uh, for the lawyers armed for the poor on the war on poverty and I began my service as a, an investigator down on 9th Street Northwest where I uh, served under 
a gentleman who later became a longtime professor of law at Howard University Law School, uh, uh, Henry, uh, can you get some help here? Uh, Jones, yes, yes, yes. We, we called him Hank. Uh, <laughs> he was a very down-to-earth man from North Carolina, as is this worthy nominee. Uh, also, I've had training in the increasingly important field of mediation and conciliation of employment disputes uh, through the uh, United States Agency that is in charge with that. Thirdly, as an enforcer of the municipal law of the district as a prosecutor in what is now the office of the Attorney General of the district. I've had uh, several employment cases favorably resolved when I was in private practice. I've been an investigator of personnel systems and abuse thereof as concerns equal op employment opportunity and there are a good over 15 employment issues that uh, we've worked on as an employee, direct employee for four years of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission established under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and I must add that uh, I at that time in the 60s was an agitator to help establish that law and get it passed by the Congress. Uh, as an EEOC employee, I investigated and wrote decisions for the Commission, the Commission's uh, office director, uh, and sixthly, I've been a manager and administrator of a private DC law office of downtown attorneys for 15 years while carrying on my own practice in varied aspects of, of law. The statutory retirements of board members of the OEA is set forth with clarity in the DC Code's Merit Systems Chapter 7, uh, Title 1, Section 606.1 through 606.5, and the annotated cases are under. By studying these sections of the code, I've acquired a good beginning knowledge of the requirements of a board member. How much time can I commit to service on the board? I aspire to carry my full share of the load to make the OEA one of the best boards in the district's firmament for boards and commissions. The mayor is a District of Columbia native and educated in public schools here. I have also been through junior high school. He's a hard worker and by his deeds and accomplishments, he's trying to advance the good reputation of the government administration of this city. And I fully support his efforts and I want to help him and my board colleagues to even higher accomplishments. I've learned, Councilman McDuffie, that on about Tuesday, February the 12th, and I'd like that to change that maybe one week earlier, maybe to on about the 5th, uh, the subcommittee held an oversight hearing on the OEA, I've learned. I believe that's close to the date. I'm not sure whether its thrust was financial, managerial, or programmatic, but in any event, if it was recorded by video or audio, I'd like to review any recordings as soon as possible to help me attain helpful knowledge. The recent past president practice, the recent past practice of the board members has been to meet with the office's general counsel once a week for about a half a day to review case recommendations. Based on the schedule, I stand ready to serve as long as necessary, but a minimum of two full days a month or more including any possible addition, additional time I may be asked to look into in administrative matters. For example, who knows the accomplishments or the potential of mediation and conciliation efforts of the OEA, which I understand have been mandatory for about a year, possibly less. I'm not being considered for any other board, nor am I an officer or employee any longer of the U.S. or district government. In broad terms, I believe the mission of the OEA is to ensure through its rulings that employees are afforded due process rights in, the practice, in practice in their appeals from adverse personnel or disciplinary actions of their respective agencies. The review by the OEA Board of Agency Actions does several things. Very importantly, it tends to ensure the public uniform and fair application of agency personnel actions which employees have a right to expect, whether represented by counsel or not. Additionally, the full five-member board can serve as an appellate review authority to deflect some workload away from the superior court if an employee chooses. 
The role of the office is to review agency decisions and to ensure that managerial discretion has been legitimately invoked and properly exercised. This is set forth in a very important case, the Stokes versus DC case by the DC Court of Appeals as annotated in 501 Atlantic 2nd, page 200, excuse me, 1006, which was decided in 1985. There's also a section on appeal procedures in section one, title one, section 606.3 of the DC Code. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'd be hard pressed to answer the question, what do I think is the greatest single challenge that faces the OEA? Today, I have an open mind. I'm still on the, quote, outside looking in, end quote. I've not yet, but hope to, begin my service there. Uh, last week, I visited the OEA office in person. I knew that the general counsel was out on sick leave, but I had uh, a 50-50 chance, I thought, that uh, the executive director was there, but she was also out on leave. But I did receive a guided tour of the office by an employee at their office at 1100 4th Street Southwest. As to any OEA backlog of cases, I'm not knowledgeable about the extent thereof at present, but some authoritative reference to the backlog may or may not have been made in the recent oversight hearing held by this subcommittee recently. Uh, if my expected colleague, Ms. Shaw, is not aware of this hearing, I'd be happy to cooperate with her to help her review that record if she's not yet seen it. DC Code Section 16062 refers to a, quote, annual report on activities of the office. I'd like to obtain those reports over the last several years and review the last even 10 years of them. Uh, matters mentioned therein should be very helpful and even perhaps provide statistical information which can give long-term trends. <clears throat> Lastly, Mediation of appeals at the OEA has been offered for several years, but only in the last years, as stated before, it has it been mandatory, mandatorily offered. The OEA recently established an, a full internal office of mediation and conciliation, and as a trained mediator, uh, mentioned in my resume, uh, and an active member of the alternative dispute resolution section of the National Bar Association, I would take a special interest in the extent and quality of the service of this function in the OEA's appeals, appeal resolution process. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared remarks, and I thank you and your staff for the chance to appear and speak to you this afternoon. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Douglas. I want to thank you both uh, for providing the committee with uh, testimony uh, and for your willingness to, to serve on uh, this very important uh, governmental body. I want to note, uh, for those who may be at home watching, that we provide nominees, uh, let me speak a little bit, we provide nominees with pre-roundtable uh, questions, and you both did provide answers to those. Uh, but some of your responses, uh, I think, are important enough to make sure that they make it into the record today. And so uh, I'll be asking a couple of questions uh, based on those pre-hearing or uh, pre-roundtable questions. I do also want to note, uh, in listening to your testimony and reviewing your resumes, you both offer a vast experience and body of work uh, to the Office of Employee Appeals, and I do appreciate that. And if confirmed, I imagine the folks at the Office of Employee Appeals, uh, including the other three board members, would also appreciate it. Uh, but I'll start my questioning uh, sort of along those lines. While you do both offer so much in terms of your experience and background, uh, what particular quality uh, do you think you bring that is of uh, a special relevance to the Office of Employee Appeals? That stopped just in time. I don't think <laughs> that. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, one of the things that I bring is that I see that there are 38 outstanding cases at this particular point in the Office uh, of Employee Appeals. Uh, one of my concerns is that of those 38, 24 
is with the DC public school system. Uh, I would think that because of my training, certainly in EEO and affirmative action, that perhaps this may be uh, an additional um, task on the other board members, but perhaps collectively with all of the knowledge that uh, with the three previous uh, board members and certainly my colleague here, that collectively we could come up with a training uh, pilot for the uh, DC public school system and others in terms of uh, management of their employees and making sure that their employees are treated fairly. Mm, uh, and I think that, that with that I would bring the expertise in providing uh, a um, curriculum that could bring uh, a better uh, factors into making sure that our caseload may be just a little lower. Okay. That's an interesting uh, recommendation. I, I did uh, want to note that that was one of the questions we asked, uh, and you mentioned in your testimony, Mr. Douglas, about uh, the backlog of cases. But if you want uh, to, Mr. Douglas, speak to what uh, particular quality you have uh, uh, that that's, uh, uh, is particularly relevant to the Office of Employee Appeals. Mm -hmm. Given uh, your vast background uh, in your body of work. Sure. Well, I'd like to say a couple of things. Um, I'm not as knowledgeable about the backlog, although it's an interesting statistic to hear that 24 of the 38 older cases, I guess, are from the D.C. public schools. Uh, One person knowledgeable in this field said uh, he prefers not to talk in terms of backlog, but of inventory. Uh, I had uh, was fortunate to serve for almost five years in the EEOC uh, when we were investigating uh, racial discrimination matters. Or, uh, but the agency as a whole, we had a very, my office in Baltimore was rated among the top offices, 32 offices in the country, in terms of quality of work produced and quality of work produced by Mr. Walter Dickerson, who was the office director, who incidentally came out of the labor movement with the uh, National Alliance of Postal Employees. But what happened in an effort to reduce the backlog, the methods of, uh, of um, investigation were changed. It was simplified, and I can tell you that the number of cases in which the investigators concluded that uh, probable cause that the discrimination complained of had actually come occurred dropped very precipitously within a matter of months after these new procedures, which were imposed from Washington, from 50 percent down to less than 1 percent. So in talking with any, about any so-called backlog or inventory, we must be very sure that we do not gut uh, the uh, purpose of the Office of Employee Appeals. Uh, that to me is, is very important because I, I, I fought the, uh, the imposition of those uh, new procedures uh, through our union. The other thing, I think it's a good idea if uh, many of the D.C. public employee, uh, former D.C. public school employees are, are indeed in the same category as, let's say, teachers, or some of them may be administrative assistants or whatnot. Uh, but I'm very interested, having been trained, and I've done arbitration for 40 years practically, mediation I haven't done been trained in quite so long, but uh, perhaps that method would offer some uh, opportunity for use with a discrete class of employees like former public school systems. So I want, would like to look into that. I see Ms. Barfield is here today. I uh, missed her last week, but uh, I'm sure, I, I hope we'll have opportunity to, uh, to talk further about this. So. Sure. Sure, and, and you noted, um, Mr. Douglas, uh, that it was important not to, to gut uh, the Office of Employee <laughs> Appeals 
um, to, to address the backlog. And I know yeah. that uh, when she did testify, uh, Ms. Barfield placed an emphasis on addressing the backlog. And I think, you know, one of the reasons they're probably uh, three excited board members sitting at home uh, listening or watching is because they, they, could, they probably welcome your, your expertise and experience and your time. Uh, so that you can you can join them in trying to address uh, some of those cases. Mm -hmm. I mentioned in my opening that the Office of Employee Appeals is tasked with adjudicating employee appeals and rendering impartial decisions. And I noted that uh, the witnesses that testified on each of your behalves uh, mentioned integrity when they spoke about you. And just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, how important it is to have integrity and, and to be impartial as you uh, perform the duties uh, associated with the work. Well, I would say this, <clears throat> very simply. When I practiced in Philadelphia, I became introduced to their system of arbitration in resolving cases. Now, the, every case filed in the local court of record, the Common Pleas Court, was required to go through arbitration before it could go on to possible trial. And uh, I kind of fell in love with the process of arbitration, but when I went there, um, we were sworn in and talked to by a full judge of the common pleas, and he reminded us that you are a judge for a day as you sit on this case. And so therefore, I believe that there's a very high necessity as well as responsibility for making good decisions such that a judge would make for the case before you for that time. And uh, that's what I've tried to do throughout my career. Ms. Shaw? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think um, uh, the mission of the Office of uh, Employee Appeals is to r render impartial, legally sufficient, and timely decisions on appeals filed by the District of Columbia's government employees. I think that if you will look through the package that has been submitted to you, that those uh, supporters of my recommendation, there was one thread that I found to be common among all of the letters that you have in my package, is that they said, I had a high level of integrity. I have practiced that, and I think that comes from parents obviously that teach you at a young age that honesty and integrity is a virtue. I have done that throughout my career uh, with the up to 135 employees that I have supervised over the last 25 years. And certainly as the treasurer uh, at a time um, when uh, it was difficult with the ANCs, uh, there was a high level of integrity uh, that was placed upon us and certainly through the DC auditor's office. So uh, I would say integrity is number one in terms of my pursuit of being a uh, important member of the Office of Employee Appeals. And we, we've talked a lot about uh, your qualifications and your experience, and, and I mentioned a couple of times that you both have lots of experience and, and, and qualifications. Uh, but one of the other things that I think uh, your fellow uh, board members uh, would want of you uh, is your time. Um, if you could talk a little bit about your understanding of the time commitment associated with being on the Board of Office uh, of Employee Appeals. Well, I talk with uh, one of the staff members, uh, and I must uh, commend Ms. Barfield, that her, uh, her uh, employees have been very personable, and any information that I've asked them to give me a heads up, they've provided. So I want to first commend her on the employees and on her team. And I think the time that they told me was about one day uh, every six weeks. But now that I have a greater understanding of, and I like the words that my uh, esteemed colleague uh, mentioned, inventory, uh, it will probably be a little bit more than once every six weeks. Uh, time is, is a virtue, as we all know. And I am um, on another board, but that is a part of my responsibilities at uh, Metro. And I don't see that it would be a conflict of interest at all. From everything I've heard, uh, Mr. McDuffie, 
whatever it takes. And I, I have the, uh, um, I think certainly one day a week would be probably more than adequate under present conditions at least to, uh, as a start to um, learn from the inside what, what our duties are, to exercise them, to, to co become practiced. And uh, hopefully in the next little while we can get the, uh, the oldest cases resolved mm -hmm. and uh, then we can uh, perhaps study this. I don't know whether it would be feasible to establish some timelines for each phase of the cases. Uh, we do have subpoena powers uh, according to the code. And um, if, you could, if you could slide forward just a little bit, Mr. Douglas, oh, I can just I'm sorry. step back a little bit and the microphone is probably not picking up the voice. All right, this is stationary. But uh, I have somewhere in my notes uh, listed, I think, 10 or 12 stages of the process. And well, uh, we, we don't have to necessarily refer to your, your notes. I, I'll move on to my next question because I noted it in Ms. Shaw's response. She just mentioned that she doesn't anticipate that her present employer will present any conflicts of interest. And I'd just like to uh, ask Same. a question of you, Mr. Douglas. That is true. I don't see foresee that. And, um, okay. And I know you, you, you mentioned it briefly in your testimony, Mr. Douglas, but I'll, I'll pose a question uh, again nonetheless and, and give you all an opportunity to respond about what you think uh, is the single greatest challenge facing the Office of Employee Appeals. I know we talked about the backlog. Perhaps that's uh, the challenge that might come to mind. But is there anything else that you think uh, presents a, a challenge uh, uh, to, the, to the work of the Office of Employee Appeals? Well, I've been handicapped myself uh, in not being able to find uh, these annual reports which uh, <laughs> were provided for in the D.C. Code. Uh, so, as I said a few minutes ago, up until now I've been I'm in a position of being on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to be presumptuous and... Uh, not fair enough. Fair enough, but I didn't want to just throw yeah. that question out there in case you had given it some. But I have, uh, having served on a number of different uh, corporate boards, uh, I have some experience in ferreting out problems okay. and providing some workable solutions to them, or at least making the suggestions whether they're adopted or not is another matter. And uh, Ms. Mr. Douglas, you mentioned it in your testimony, uh, but I'll, I'll ask Ms. Shaw uh, whether or not you're being considered for any additional boards uh, here in the District of Columbia. Uh, in the District of Columbia, not at this time, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, uh, you have a list of those uh, boards that I am presently uh, a part of, and I will uh, like to explain a couple of them uh, in terms of um, as you can see, uh, you have a, a list from my resume of about two pages of boards that I have been uh, working on. Uh, and I have uh, not elected to have uh, my terms extended. So uh, presently, I would only be on two boards uh, the, uh, in the District of Columbia, the National Association of Minority Contractors, and of course, uh, the uh, a board member with the Office of um, Employee Appeals. Okay. And I asked it initially in the context of your current employment, but I want to just sort of make it uh, uh, more of an open-ended question about any uh, anything that you any any work or. Uh, activities you might be engaged in that might present any sort of conflict or challenges uh, to, to, to render uh, uh, your responsibilities as a member of the Board of the Office of Employee Appeals? Anything else outside of your work or anything else? I know of none. Uh, I know of none, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is there anything else uh, that you'd like to, to, to state or share with the committee uh, as we contemplate uh, a markup of your nominees? Uh, Anything else you'd like to share that I haven't already asked previously? Well, I'd like to uh, share uh, in a closing comment that I'm looking forward, if uh, confirmed as a member 
of the um, board for the Office of Employee Appeals. I look forward to working with my other colleagues and certainly uh, hopefully I can uh, offer them some valuable information and they can also help me in learning those things that I don't know about uh, in detail. Ms. Douglas? That's a very good response here, Council, sir. Um, I would Say ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Simple enough. Uh, I appreciate the brevity. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any further questions uh, of the nominees today, and so I want to thank, uh, again, you all for coming down to testify, uh, your willingness to, to serve on, on the uh, Office of Employee Appeals Board, uh, and your willingness to, to, to serve the District of Columbia. Uh, I also want to thank the witnesses uh, who came down to testify on your behalf uh, for taking their time out of their day to do so. Uh, the, as chair of the committee, I, I really appreciate uh, hearing from the nominees, but also from uh, witnesses who will support those nominations. I do also want to note uh, for the record that uh, the, the committee did receive a written testimony of Carl E. Brown, uh, Jr., uh, in support of Ms. Shaw. And so that's going to be incorporated into the record. Hmm. And with that, I'd like to thank, again, everyone uh, for their time here today and for their testimony. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Yeah. excuse yes. me, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned only today that because of the time pressures that the committee markup would be tomorrow. And that was, there have been several other people who had offered to uh, um, provide uh, uh, written statements uh, which will not be able to get into the record because of the brevity of time. I would like be able to at least submit their names. I discussed this with uh, your committee chair. Um, sure, you can. I can free. either do it here Maybe or you can get to the committee by email. Yes, ah, uh, very we'll good. Accept yes. incorporate to the record. Yes, and also I was sort of had a little short. I uh, lost a little time due to some recent uh, medical problems, but I'm well on the end now. So. Well, I, I regret yeah. uh, hearing that, but but yeah. I'm pleased that you are uh, back on your feet and mm -hmm. ready to serve. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. Ms. Shaw, you want to close uh, the Mr. Chairman, yes, I wanted to also uh, thank uh, Mr. Carly Brown, Jr., who is the uh, Executive Director for the Center for Minority Affairs. Uh, Mr. Brown took ill today, and that is the reason he is not in attendance. But also, you should have letters from uh, Shirley Blair, who is the President of Advanced Technology Group Incorporated, and Mr. Joe W. Moore, who have also submitted a written testimony in support. Okay, and we'll, we'll incorporate all the, the written uh, letters of support that the committee receives uh, to make sure that the record is complete as we uh, contemplate the markup. And with that, the time is now 3.05 p.m. on Monday, uh, February 25th, the same day we started. And this roundtable is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Good